and the URI Honors Program, which brings us um, programs that feed our curiosity and enrich our intellectual lives. And I'd also like to note that we have had a series of special sponsors that have helped support these lectures. These have included the URI College of Arts and Sciences, Rhode Island Sea Grant, which is celebrating its 40th anniversary this year. And tonight, we're very pleased to thank the URI Harrington School of Communication and Media, which is a new program that, of course, is very apropos for this evening's, this evening's talk. I'd like to send you to the website for the Vettelson Lecture Series just to let you know that there's additional information about all of our speakers there and some recommended reading from them. And that URL is not on this slide, but it's very easy to find. It's just uri.edu backslash Vettelson. And then finally, before I introduce the person who will be introducing tonight's speaker, I'd like to note that this is the time to turn off your cell phones if you have not already done so. Thank you very much. And also, we're recording this entire lecture, so if you have some especially crinkly paper, like candy wrappers or, I don't know, plastic of some sort, your chips perhaps, please open them now so that you're not crinkling them during the lecture. And with that, I am very pleased to introduce Dr. Winifred Brownell. Dr. Brownell is the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and she has been teaching here at URI as a professor of communication studies for the past 20 years, um, has served a variety of roles here at the university during that time. And I also wanted to especially note that she developed a course on the environmental dimensions of communication in 1971 or thereabouts, wow. which of course presaged this entire conversation. And um, if only people had been listening to that in the early 70s, perhaps we'd be much further along right now. Um, I'd also like to note that the College of Arts and Sciences is the biggest college at URI. It has over 40 undergraduate and graduate degree programs, serves over 4,500 majors and 15,000 students. So it is a very significant part of this, this institution. And also, I'd just like to note that Dr. Brownell has received many awards in her time here, including, just to name a few, the URI Foundation Teaching Excellence Award in 1988, um, the Lambda Pi Eta Richard Bailey Service Award for Excellence in the Art of Human Communication in 1999, and the Rhode Island International Film Festival Producers Circle Award in 2006. She clearly has a long-standing interest in communication and in bridging the gap between science and communication, and I'm pleased to welcome her to give the introduction for tonight's lecture. Because she has a broken foot, she's going to do this from right down here. So if I could draw your attention to the front of the stage, Dr. Brownell. Thank you. I wouldn't have missed this if I had to crawl in. I, I remember one of the early days of the Metcalf Institute. Scientists have an interesting rhetorical challenge and ethical one. And the Metcalf Institute brings together brilliant scientists with uh, aspiring um, journalists who wish to cover science. They may have covered a lot of great stories in different areas from politics to local affairs, but they've chosen to learn more about how to cover science. And it's like people from two different universes meeting. It's interesting, the scientist deals with such complex information, vast amounts of data, a, a different sort of language, and journalists are eager to learn and want to cover science stories as accurately as possible. But depending upon the type of journalist, they may do so very differently. But my favorite moment was the two extremes. A brilliant oceanographer who shall remain nameless, who is giving a wonderful presentation that was a good model for what to cover, and one of our local very fine uh, news reporters on television. And the scientist was adding all kinds of interesting nuances. And finally, the journalist kept asking and asking, and the scientist said, you just don't understand. This is very complex. It's highly nuanced. There are a lot of variables. And the journalist said, you don't understand. I go live at 6. I have two and a half minutes. And what I say is going to be repeated over and over again. you got to help me. Well, people like Chris Reddy will help him and will help generations to come. Uh, as a representative of the Harrington School of Communication and Media, I'm really honored to be here to welcome home a grad who received his PhD in oceanography from URI, 
dr. reddy was awarded an aldo leopold leadership fellowship in two thousand and six which teaches scientists to communicate environmental science to the public media and policy makers he presents scientific talks to lay audiences throughout the country and has published more than twenty op-ed articles or editorials in leading science-based issues and many media outlets and he so ably translates complex scientific information to ensure that it's understandable to a lay audience in the past fifteen years dr. reddy has studied several oil spills including the nineteen ninety six north cape spill on the rhode island coast off the rhode island coast and the two thousand three spill in buzzards bay he traveled aboard the URI research vessel Endeavor last summer to study the Deepwater Horizon spill in the Gulf of Mexico, where he was the first to report finding a sizable underwater plume of oil after BP and government officials said that no plume existed. A native Rhode Islander, Reddy studies the impact of oil spills and other contaminants on coastal ecosystems. He's also beginning to turn his attention to biodiesel by trying to anticipate and analyze how this new fuel might react when it in inevitably mixes with water. Please help me give Dr. Chris Reddy a warm roadie welcome home. He's going to talk about box scores, discovering the lost continent of Atlantis, and a side of cancer. Well, th well, thank you for having me here. I appreciate it. And uh, the last time I was in this auditorium was in 1985. I was on the, I hate to admit it, the computer team. I was at the state finals taking a test up there. Um, so this is a lot more enjoyable. I am going to talk about science and communication and with respect to the Deepwater Horizon plume. I am not going to pull any punches. This is my first talk about this. I hope you enjoy it. Um, and let's just uh, go on in, OK? OK, I'm going to show you the next slide. I'm going to give you about five seconds. Now I'm going to give you 10 seconds, and I want to see who raises their arms to the question that I have. OK, I don't want you just tell me if you know the answer by raising your hand. Which hitter scored? Got the, got the most hits for the visitor in the ninth inning. Visiting team, ninth inning, who got the most hits? What, what batter? Can you see it? Anybody know the answer? Where's my brother Joe? You must know it. Nobody. The visiting team. I mean, the, oh gosh, the home team. I just proved my point. Okay, all right. Home team. What I was trying to say. This is what happens. Uh, the home team didn't bat in the bottom of the ninth because they were winning, so it didn't matter. They need to bat. Okay. Okay. Just remember. Now you open up any newspaper today you will see a whole slew of these uh, box scores every day in the back of the newspaper, even though most people don't read them because they watch their scores on SportsCenter. We'll get back to that later. So, so, the, so I, I kind of was hinting towards there's a certain language in baseball, and this is how sometimes it's transcribed to you readers. Uh, you can hear it on the radio to the equivalent across the pond on the BBC for cricket. Now, Winnie was talking about language. What is this? Right? <laughs> there is a language, right? You have to know the language to understand what's going on. Okay? So let's go to baseball. Why is baseball such an interesting observation? For, for me, I like baseball. But there's a language to baseball, there's a culture, there's customs, there's rules. We have passion about it. We learned how to play from multiple translators. So more than one person taught us some aspect of the rules, whether it was our parents, our coaches, our TV. We learned the nuances of baseball 
over time. And in fact, we continue to learn the nuance. If you're a baseball fan, you're constantly, you're in continuing education about baseball. This whole idea, this concept of baseball is this never-ending understanding, okay? Fans get it. The media does a really good job reporting it. You can't listen to it. You can't change the channel and hear about the Red Sox. But we don't get science the same way. We don't, we, the, the lay public doesn't understand our language, our rules, our customs, why we're passionate. We certainly don't have full-time radio shows about two guys arguing about you know, who looks better in the uniform. The, these things just don't happen. And this is one of the troubles that we have in trying to understand science, is that we don't have an opportunity for a variety of translators to bring science to the lay public. And we don't have continuing education. We can't, we're not constantly learning more, because once we leave high school or college, you know, we really stop learning about the science, and in fact, we might not have ever embraced it. Okay, let's talk about oil spills. I'm done with baseball and cricket. Um, I'm going to talk about communicating science. In many respects, I give talks about communicating science, and the first thing I get from a scientist in the audience is, I once gave an interview to a reporter, and it came out terrible. I hated it. I'm never going to do it again. The media is everything that's evil. And I go, how do you know you didn't give a bad talk? Bag interview. How do you know that you didn't confuse this poor reporter who was on deadline, like Winnie just said, and had two and a half minutes, and had to get something going, and you confused that person so to such an extreme that the end result was something poor? And usually when I say that, the people go, oh. So, so um, that's what I'm going to try to talk about today, how we can get past the uh. So I'm going to talk about Deepwater Horizon. I'm going to just start off with some pictures. Um, this is an oiled marsh from about 150 miles away from the spill. That's um, moose or oil about a mile away from the blowout. Um, if we shut off the house lights, that is me testing how thick the oil is. This is oil right here. And we had to test how thick the oil was by squirting some water and dawn. And if you squirt it, you could clean it up before you lowered a piece of equipment. That's the blue location. One time, I got to be really close to the blowout, and I was on a ship in between the two fires that were on, t on fire. So I was right, basically sitting right over the, uh, where the blowout was. Um, that might have been the most surreal moment of my life. So I am going to talk to you about what I've done in this bill. If you read this list, you're going to say, that guy's a raving egomaniac. And I am. <laughs> but I need to show you my street cred here. And I need to show you that I've kind of seen every side of, of the big picture that's happened in a spill. I've been very lucky to be afforded to see all the different views that's going on in a spill. I've done a lot of research, writing papers. Uh, let me see what else I've done. I've uh, written a lot of opinion pieces about science and the media. I've, I've spent some time on Capitol Hill and also working with the President's Commission on this bill. Uh, I think I've probably given three to 400 interviews about this bill. And um, the, perhaps the most interesting thing was I was asked to be the first academic liaison at the Unified Area Command, which is the oil spill headquarters. And my job was to make sure that BP and all the other federal agencies had some in exchange between academia, because there was a bridge that was broken. Um, and it was a fascinating opportunity that I'm going to talk about later. Um, and now I'm also on this National Academy of Sciences Committee that's trying to figure out how much of the ecosystem was damaged. So um, forgive me for my egoness, but I, I had to just let you know that uh, I understand a little bit of what's going on. Okay, I'm going to give out a report card. Now, I'm going to give Bs for answers that I'm not quite sure I know the answers to, uh, or they're, they're still open-ended. So getting involved. Now, um, oil spills, and I've been studying for many more years, by most oceanographers and marine scientists is considered dirty work. No, nobody ever really studies it. It's kind of like, it's, it's not the gentlemanly oceanography that people like to think. Nevertheless, a lot of people got involved in this bill. Might be the size, 
might be the news, it may be for a variety of reasons. Um, a lot of papers are now getting pumped out. I would say that they're pretty good, so that's encouraging. Um, willingness to speak to the media, I think has been not bad by scientists who in the past, if you did speak to the media, you were considered kind of a show off or a sellout. So I, I think that that's been pretty good. Where we had a little trouble is talking to everybody else. You know, how well, you know, it's one thing, we can talk well between ourselves. You know, I, I can call up my friend in California and say, what are you getting for methane at 1,100 meters? And he's going to tell me 182 micromolar, and I'm going to understand that, because we have very good, we understand each other's language. We, we're very well connected in that respect. But everybody else, man, we had some troubles. And I'm going to talk about them, but I think they're troubles that we can fix. And I think that we can learn from Deepwater Horizon and use this as an opportunity to jump into a new direction in which science and communication are no longer considered opposite sides of the pole, but working in tandem. Why is the C? Well, well there's a lot of problems. Uh, we had some scientists doing a variety of things. I'm going to go through each of these one by one. Uh, with the exception, I don't have a slide for memory effect. The memory effect is that a scientist would say something, a lot of scientists said some things in May, and they were so dire that they still hold on today, even though they've been disproved. It's kind of like somebody who's been accused of something, guilt of a crime, and they've been, they've been declared innocent, but that accusal still, you can never get rid of that stigma. Um, scientists have to recognize that most people really, uh, especially journalists, are take their word on face value. It's hard for them to double check. And so when you say something, you have to repair that it may last for a long time, ingrained in people's heads. I'm going to go through the rest of these one by one. I'm going to be a little tongue in cheek here. There's a big difference from an environmental scientist and an environmentalist. Okay, An environmental scientist wants to know, what do we know? What do we don't know? What's changing? What's on the debate? It's important pressing questions about how the Earth lives. In this case, how do we respond to an uninvited guest that happened to be 200 million gallons of crude oil? We want to understand all these things, OK? In this case, this is me and a couple of my friends when the air quality was so poor that we had to change our gear. An environmentalist may actually have good intentions, and they span a wide spectrum, just like environmental scientists, but they often have an agenda, and they often may be getting, their passion may get in the way of maybe making, you know, the fairness that science really has. So an environmental scientist should strive to be dispassionate about the results, but passionate about the study. This is where we need to stick. We cannot stray off. We cannot start to think that BP is bad. I don't care if BP spilled oil. I don't care if it's MVP. I don't care who, I don't care if it's URI oil. My job is to understand how that oil behaved after the event occurred. We had some scientists speaking like environmentalists, which I think was misleading to, uh, to the lay public. This is Atlantis. This is part of my, so I got two of my jokes in already. Some of my colleagues thought that the spill was a competition. We found it first. I once heard a scientist talk about some data that we presented, and, and this person said, her data, our data couldn't hold a candle to her data in terms of concentrations. I was like, what? My oil is bigger than your oil? I mean, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, but, but, but there's that mentality. And it's not absolutely this person's fault. We've been trained to be bulldogs, to try to be the first one there. The, this is all about how science works, to be out there first. But in the case of oil spills, it's not a race. It's about doing good science. It's about helping to, end, to provide science that provides a fair settlement to all parties involved and perhaps helps give information for them to make the most well-informed decisions in the past. That kind of got missed, okay? There was a little too, comp too much competition. 
we miss the big picture. When you, and I learned this the hard way because I once got an email during the Buzzards Bay oil spill from somebody in the federal government who said, call me up, and I called him up, and he said, you talk too much, you're a pain in my A, and um, my life would be considerably better if you didn't talk to the media so often. So I told him to do what he should do with himself and continue to do that. And then about five years later, I saw him, and I said, why did you do that to me? Why did you call me? He said, because I was trying to put out, I was dealing with a very complex oil spill. And every five seconds, instead of trying to deal with trying to corral thousands and thousands of gallons of oil, I had to deal with your stupid local newspaper saying that this two-bit scientist is saying that there's naphthalene in the water. And he said, it was a pain. Now, this is a fine line, right? I can't be censored. He can't censor me. But at the same time, we have to recognize that scientists sometimes don't recognize, you know, I kind of think about this as when, you know, watching these people, who, many, many good people working on the spill, trying to stop this oil, trying to clean it up as a firefighter, trying to put out a house fire. And there's a scientist over there with a pH meter saying, I got to get, I can, sh shut the hose off. Can, can I just get this one sample? If I get this one more sample, I'll get a paper. I can be in science. And that's what happens. And unfortunately, we don't really understand each other's worlds. So that's not only science, it's also people understanding in terms involved in the response. But those people in the response have to, this is the federal responders, have to respond every time a lay public scientist says, oh, the pH of that water is too, it's very acidic. It's very time consuming. That's a tough one. Okay, these fantail press conferences. If you go on a research cruise, you don't play shuffleboard. You eat well, okay? But you work 24 hours a day. You, you work like a dog, especially when you're out there in this spill. It's hot. There's oil everywhere. You're stressing out. You're trying to get all this stuff done. You haven't had enough time to prepare, which only exacerbates the problems. You're sleeping in a bed that makes your dorm room bunk look palatial. I mean, you're, you know, I'm, my, I have to sleep with a leg over here. And there are scientists who had the willingness, and then you have to face with dock rock, which is you're on a boat the whole time, and finally you get on land, and you still think you're rocking. And they're giving press conferences about data that they haven't really thought about. You don't do that. If you were on any other scientific cruise, you get home, you kiss your spouse, you walk your dog, you watch the Red Sox, there's a baseball theme here, you chill out, you go back to work in a couple days, and you start thinking about the, how important your results are. And if they're really important, then you might want to notify somebody who's working on the spill. But, but you don't give a press conference when you're tired. You, you, you don't have all your senses. And, and I see, saw a mistake after mistake of people doing this, and it was heartbreaking to watch them go down. OK, all, all, all oil spill scientists hate the Exxon Valdez spill. Now, it's not we hate it because, of course, it was 11 million gallons of crude oil. I got news for you. It's number 55 or 56 on the all-time oil spill numbers. So it's not a big spill. The reason why it's very big in your eyes, and for a variety of reasons, is when CNN was just starting up, they needed more filler. 24-hour news. In many respects, that's how Exxon got, I mean, the Valdez spill got space. There are other factors, too. It drives me crazy because the first rule of oil spill science is no oil spill is the same. You have different types of oil. It's like buying a house. It's location, location, location. There are so many variables at play that think that you could, could use as a comparison some oil that happened in Alaska and compare it down to the Gulf of Mexico and make linear um, interpolations between it, extrapolations is ridiculous. And no science, in fact, if you go to the oil spill Bible, oil in C3, one of the things they always say is never compare one oil to another. You, you learn from them.
But you don't necessarily think, okay, for every gallon of oil that spilled an Exxon, so many birds died. Well, that must be the same um, in Deepwater Horizon. That's not true. So let's look at this quote. What happened at the Valdez? Look forward to, to hear. That's not true at all. Um, it's not a pretty picture. If you are a fisherman and your wife works at the fish factory processing them and you are can't, you, neither one of you are working and spousal abuse is going up because you're not working, you're not bringing an income, do you want to read it's not a pretty picture? Is that accurate? Is that fair? Not much of this is actually quite accurate. I mean, it's, it's just text. Interesting, though. One reporter called out the scientists. If you have a chance, go on the web and find Mike Thomas on the Orlando Sentinel. And he, he wrote about, about six weeks ago, he said, you know what? The loudest scientists, the ones who have the most catastrophic discussions, are not publishing papers. While the ones who are quieter and more reserved are writing papers and getting published to them in, in peer-reviewed journals. And, and then he went in and looked at the, the science of science. And it's probably most, one of the most well done snapshots about how science works. Was a, was a columnist. He's not a scientist, he's a columnist. Um, I highly recommend it. But he, this was a blow. I can't tell you. I was in Washington, D.C. I opened up my Blackberry. I had 30 forwards of this article because everybody said, can you believe it? Can you believe it? OK, here's Mandy Joy, who's been working really hard on the spill. She gives a very nice interview here. She says, gold is keep oil off the beaches. It drives the economy. True. You can skim it. True. You can burn it. True. You can do something with it. Yeah. But when these tiny particles will persist for God knows how long. How is God knows how long? Is that a year? Is that five years? That's just, I mean, now the problem is she may have stopped for a second and, and was incapable of making an estimate. So she, you know, kind of sighed. She may have sighed and said, God, I, I don't know how long. I, I don't, you know, this is one of the problems when you, you read articles, you know, you lose some of the nuances as opposed to whether it was on the radio or television. But th this is unfortunate. It, it, it suggests that the oil may last in the environment longer than Methuselah. And that's just not good. And then, then there's just over the top. Sylvia Earle, Congress. Really? Just about everyone on the planet? If the Unabomber hadn't been caught in his little hut somewhere, I don't even know where, before his brother turned him in, would he have cared about the Deepwater Horizon? Honestly, I mean, th these statements are so over the top that they fail to recognize that it dilutes good science and it impacts the species that was the most damaged from the spill, which is the people of the Gulf. When you hear these types of over-the-top statements, it does not make you feel good. It makes people say, maybe I should move away. I, I read this quote every time. I can't, I, 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 I'm, it is very hard to make me speechless if you've spent any time with me. I, I have nothing to say. OK, lacked awareness. My fault. This is a picture of a former graduate student of mine, Helen White. She's working on an oil spill that occurred in 1969. We've been studying that spill for about 10 years. It is a special spill because oil still persists there now 40 years later. And it affects the fiddler crabs, it affects the grass, and it affects shellfish in that area. So when people start talking about long-term damages to salt marshes, which run along the Gulf, everybody wants to talk to me. And I go, fine, I have a great opportunity to educate the public. Because you know what? The story isn't, in my mind, that we do have some damages. 
it's that the damages that still last for four decades were about as big as maybe a block of these chairs, and the spill overwhelmed acres and acres and acres of land. And that less than one-tenth of one-tenth of percent of the oil that impacted this horrible, uh, from this horrible spill still persists. It happened in the fall. They called it silent autumn because it was so damaging. So I was like, yeah, this is an important place. Yes, it's a living laboratory. Yes, oil still persists. Yes, it can be damaging. But it's a very, very small fraction. All the rest of this oil that, la that was horrible for a couple years cannot be found. And, and the rest of the, the of Buzzards Bay in this area looks like it should be on a postcard. So I did interview after interview, big newspapers. And then I would write follow-up emails. And I would remind them of my points. And then I scanned in, for a couple of them, pictures from other oil spills where there was spills where marshes rebounded in less than a year. And I wrote, I know in one of them, for a very, very, very big newspaper, please, 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 please consider that in some cases marshes can rebound all of them in a year. Never happened. Never considered that. I probably did about five of these interviews. I should have stopped at two. I have more media training than I know. I could choke a horse, and I didn't get it. I just went out there thinking that I could change people's minds, and I couldn't. I could not fight these journalists in this case, and I messed up. And I perpetuated a big problem about long-term oil in the marsh like this. He has good intentions. He probably read some of my students' papers. He says it's going to persist for decades. Maybe 20 years. Yeah, but how much of that oil? And where? And is it a problem? And if it does persist, is it safer to leave it? Or to bring in big bulldozers and knock out much, much greater area? These statements are dangerous because they magnify negative impacts. And they don't put any qualify quantifiers on it. They could say, there is data that shows that small portions can last for the environment. Now, that person may have said that, but didn't get picked up in the quote, and that's the game you have to play. This is the chromatogram effect. This is a st stunningly spectacular chromatogram that came out of my lab, and I think this is great, and I could bore you to death about comprehensive two-dimensional gas chromatography with a time-of-flight mass spectrometer operating in a superstar mode of the, an extra turbo pump. The lay public and media don't care about my chromatograms or any of the technology often that I brought to bear. They want to know if the data in this chromatogram means something. Scientists love to talk about their toys. And they start off talking about their toys. I don't care about your toys if you're in the media. Tell me what you found with this thing. I don't care. Too many acronyms. And, and when we go in this direction, we are almost guaranteed to confuse the public uh, to the, to the uh, journalist. And, and, and it just goes down the wrong road. I've done it myself. I'm a huge gearhead. My lab's got lots of toys. And I have to remember that they don't care about the bells and whistles. They just want to know what it means. There's a football coach. I'm switching over the football. A guy named Paul Brown coached the football team, the Cleveland Browns. My brother-in-law taught us this uh, line when I was a young kid. What it means is Brown was telling his football players that when you score a touchdown, you score the touchdown, you put the ball down and you go back to work. You know, And you might be highlighted because you just did something. But you act like you've been there before. You, you behave like you would otherwise. Scientists, some scientists, did not do that. They might have been overwhelmed. Whatever the case may be, they left their status quo and started spiking footballs in the touchdown, in the, in the end zone, when they probably just could have been cool hand Luke like they usually are, and they would have been fine, or even better. So, I just beat up on scientists a lot harder 
If you saw this in most cases, most would be the other way around. The media did this, the media did this, the media did this, this and this and this and this, and they misquoted Mandy Joy, and Sylvia Earle didn't mean that, and blah, 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 blah. I think it's the other way around. I think it's, I think it's on our backs now. I think, uh, I think we got our, I think we got to come up to the plate. And uh, I'm going to talk about it a little bit more now. And it's not just me who's saying this. Sherry Bullitt was on the House Science Committee for about two decades, one of the more influential people in science and funding in, in the United States um, up until a couple of years ago. He was uh, had his degree, I think, in um, uh, political science. But his key point was, if Congress needs something for you, and I, I'm saying when you talk to the media, I'm also talking about the lay public or even policymakers. It's anytime the scientists have to talk outside their own little laboratories. He says, look, I don't care about this. It's not, tell me the real deal. I don't, I don't want this, some great advance. I just want to, I want you to tell me what's important. Not just Sherry, it's Don Kennedy. Don Kennedy was the president of Stanford University, uh, editor for Science Magazine, which is the most or one of the most influential science journals in the world. He was the director of the Food and Drug Administrator. He is considered one of the more wise men of science. Look at this quote. It is breathtaking. If we do not get science right, Policy decisions are likely to be wrong. If we do not add clarity to important issues, we are in for trouble. OK, let's give the scientists a little break. Let's go to the bottom of the inning. We're playing the media. <laughs> I think the media treated this spill like the O.J. Simpson trial. OK, I'll talk a little bit about that. I think that, as many of you may know, that science journalism are now, journalists are a, are a minority, and that was a problem. I think most in the media and also everywhere else except for science don't know how science works. There was a get em attitude. That get em attitude was once a reporter from a very, very, very important and big newspaper once said, I got them now referring to a particular industry, uh, company that's built some oil. Um, and then there's, of course, this attitude, if it bleeds, it leads, which is, you know, that, uh, you know, if you see a dead pelican, let's do a story on a dead pelican, because a dead pelican is going to draw your hearts. In journal, and, and, the, and sometimes they talk about something called heat beats light. Heat, that means romance, and your passion beats enlightenment. That happened. OK, the O.J. Simpson trial. Every week, there was a thing. Plumes, dispersants, oil spill budget calculators, kill shot, top hat. Uh, I can't even think of the rest of them. And I would get a new phone call from about 10, 10 reporters or so, maybe even more, about the flavor of the week. Most of the reporters who handled this spill were general assignment reporters. Not many of them had an environmental understanding or a science background. And they covered it this like, I think, like a trial. A trial that has got some pizzazz to it. And they often highlighted stuff that wasn't very newsworthy, but it happened to be salacious. Now, a lot of you may know something about science journalism. Uh, National Science of Science Writers, I used an acronym. Now, when scientists use acronyms in my lab, they have to pay a quarter. Uh, we are an acronym-free lab. Um, we had 12 science writers, Sputnik, Science Times. Here's the key data. Um, 95 weekly science sections in 1989, 44 in 1992, 24 in 2005. A lot of them now are in health. And, and many of these really nice, uh, the CNN sci desk, and the Boston Globe are gone. And uh, there's a variety of reasons why these uh, sections are removed. W one more important point of why these sections got very popular was in the 80s and 90s, 
Um, computer sales were really big. Computer advertisements were really big. Well, if you're into computers, where are you going to look in a newspaper? That's how science got actually filled up a lot. And then that, that, um, that need went away. So we don't have many science writers out there. I could talk all day about how people don't understand science, and, and I'm, I understand it too. I, I've tried to explain it to a lot of people. It's, it's, it's like trying to explain football to somebody who never played football. I'm sorry for the sports things, but think about explaining what a down is. It's, it's hard. Um, I think people think that when pa the first series of pa published papers came out about Deepwater Horizon, they thought that they were all kind of a serial, like a Charles Dickens book, you know, one and then the next one. And the next chapter was going to be in line with the next chapter, and, and it was all going to lay out, and, and maybe the next chapter would clarify the, first, the second chapter and the first chapter and so on and so on. That's not the way science works especially in the deep water horizon. You're going to have a whole series of scientific reports that are going to be like a book in a bookcase. Now, this may be a paper on atmospheric, um, you know, how much oil went to the atmosphere. This may be one about toxic uh, uh, effects of dispersants. Uh, this may be a new map instead of this poor woman right here. Uh, these National Geographics may be very pretty maps. The point of the matter is the filling in of this bookcase is not going to be neat and orderly. It's not going to be predictable. Science, there's so many scientists working on this bill. There's such a long lag time in some cases that we are going to fill in this bookcase. And then someday, if you really want to know the history of this bill, you've got to read the whole bookcase, or at least the ones you like. No different than going to a library about if you're interested in the Civil War. So, let's talk about, uh, now I'm going to use my Rhode Island accent, sure. He said a really interesting thing. British and Americans, two peoples divided by a common language. I don't think journalists are and, media, and, the, and the science are. I think that journalists and science are... One people divided by different languages. Now, Winnie kind of set me off on languages, so it was really nice. I appreciate that. Um, we have different languages. We have different customs. We have different mannerisms. We have cultures that are different. And if we don't learn each other's customs, we are in for trouble. This is no different than so many things in the real world about not understanding people's customs and cultures and such. And despite these difficulties, I think there are more similarities between science and journalism than there are differences. We have a critical mission. When we're really good, we want to do the same thing. Research exhaustively, discover knowledge, communicate it accurately and objectively to others who need to know. That's both of our jobs. Now, there's 15 people in the world who read my papers. But if you're a pretty good journalist, there might be 15 million who read your articles. And there are other nuances. But nevertheless, we're actually pretty similar. We have to recognize that. I think we have to embrace that more than we, we actually find that it's a problem. We do have differences, though. We do have a little differences, and Winnie hinted at it again. Your run-of-the-mill um, um, general assignment reporter gets an assignment around noon, has to file by 5 or 6. Forgive me if I'm a little off on the time. But let's say their, their project is six hours long. I'm working on a paper that I started writing in November. Okay? Okay? PhD theses take three, four, five years to write. We live on a completely different time scale. That's not to say that they're bad. It's just that we have to accept that we live on different time scales. It's just like your friend who's always late. 
you just accept that. You know that that person's always late. Well, well, maybe that person likes to wash their hands too many times. Who knows what it is? We have to recognize that there are customs and cultures between science and journalism that makes them sometimes different. And if we can identify them and appreciate them, we can do a better job. So we can work together. And we can help understand our jobs and roles. If we just knew a little bit more about each other. I think, I think the scientists need to understand that the media is their friend. It can project and translate. A good science writer can translate what you're trying to say clearly and concisely in a way that people can appreciate it. Some of the work that you've spent hours in the lab and washing glassware and banging your head against the wall, and, you, and, and 15 people are going to appreciate it, but, but a science writer finds it interesting, and a million people will, will, can get the take-home message. Isn't that ex outstanding? Isn't that fast? Isn't that make you feel good that you actually can touch people with your research? <sighs> The journal, I, I really want to go to that next slide. Um, journals have to understand that science is just not black and white. And I mean, you know, they always get mad at science. Well, if, well, you know, I don't know, and this caveat this and caveat this and caveat this, and well, maybe, you know, if the sun lines up like that, it's my son's birthday, and I like, there's a lot of vanilla ice cream and Newport Creamery, I can say this. And, you know, we got to find some dialogue in that. But I definitely think we can work together to educate the public, and we do this by reminding the public some very important points. And we can do this every opportunity we can. We have to first recognize that science is not a house of cards. That when you make a mistake and they happen all the time, the cards do not, the, does not all fall down. Science is incremental. You can make a mistake because it's much more like a jigsaw puzzle. If you put in the wrong piece over here, Okay, so South America. So we're over here in the North Atlantic, and you're trying to put the North Atlantic, this is maybe the, the North Pacific, and you're putting in there. The whole globe doesn't fall apart. You make a mistake. Some scientist corrects you. You keep moving forward. It's incremental. We correct ourselves. We have a w much better, there's, we don't have many Bertie Madoffs in science. Why not? We correct, we self-police ourselves much better, and we need to tell people that. We don't live in a CSI world. Now, my wife's up there, and I'm not going to make her stand up because she'll kill me. But a couple years ago, we got into Netflix. And we Netflixed every uh, year of CSI, the original show. It's a crime scene investigation, television show, Las Vegas. Well, I'm annoying. It's in my genetic code to start off with. But I can be particularly annoying when I watch CSI. And because, uh, and in fact, my wife had to make a rule. And the rule was I could only open my mouth once, <laughs> OK? Because it drove me crazy. They were analyzing for DNA in a gas chromatograph in six seconds. I go, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. And, 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 and you, they're doing worse. They, they had, they had unbelievably 100% accurate and in, 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 almost instantaneously. I don't remember any of these TV shows, and I watched some of them from a scientific perspective, of course. Um, and I've never seen the science, uh, science tech who, who always happens to be last pick in gym class or some goth freak. You know, Why can't we just have some guy or woman who looks nice and normal? You can't because, because Hollywood doesn't have the time to build a character around these people, and they would rather prefer and build on stereotypes. Um, Hollywood does this all the time. If they, they can rely on a stereotype instead of spending the time to build a character. OK, my other pet peeve is um, there is no way, even I'm a pretty good scientist. I'm actually a really good chemist, I think. There is no way I could analyze DNA, a bullet, fingerprints, Mm, and how fast a car was going before it hit a fire hydrant. I can't. I don't have those skill sets. I wish I could. Now, it's funny on this show, but, but it's a perception that is woven into the society that these types of skill sets are available to, to one people. It's not the case. Deepwater Horizon, for example, understanding the biological impacts of that spill will take 
50, 100 people working, 200 people working. Some of them are going to have to get in a room for t days to get some idea of what happened. Not one last pick in gym class. That is not going to happen, okay? And we have to get accept, we have to accept that we may not get all the answers. This is very likely the case in Deepwater Horizon. I do think a lot of people are going to be unfulfilled with some of the results because it was such a big spill over a large space, over a long time period, that getting some feeling that 54.9999% evaporated and 32.667% biodegraded, not going to happen. Okay? We're going to have very big windows. A lot evaporated, not a lot biodegraded. I'd be happy with that. Maybe some numbers. But we're not going to have that type of, you ever go on Excel and divide a number by another number and you get, you know, 100, num 100 digits after the decimal point. Uh, that doesn't happen. You're not going to have that type of certainty. We, everybody has a job with the blogs and the wikis. Uh, uh, if I have time afterwards, ask me about San Francisco. Who polices them? I'm going to talk to you about, I'm not sure if you can see this. This is a, a nice little image that we showed after we found, I, excuse me, we didn't find it. Um, we observed this, uh, this plume of uh, water that was containing hydrocarbons at Deepwater Horizon. So this is Deepwater Horizon. We've got some oil coming up. And we, we did some work, and we found this at 1,100 meters. We found some. And, and, and there was a big press conference down in Washington, D.C., and it was a particularly grueling one because the, the press wanted answers that we couldn't give to. But the interesting thing is um, I kept showing them this picture. That was the water that we found in the plume. Now, there were hydrocarbons in the plume, but the water was not Hershey syrup. It was not a chocolate river of death. Okay? It was water that contained hydrocarbons. It was not a river of oil. This is on the blog. 25 mile river of oil. What am I going to do? Actually, the rest of the stuff's not bad. Um, it's not a river of oil. It's a plume of water that contains hydrocarbons. And I said this a hundred times. It didn't work. This is a hard job. I don't know how we're going to get past this. It's on the list, though. How do we prepare scientists? Well, we need to train them on the real world, and not an MTV sense. Um, that would be funny, though. Uh, <laughs> but we got to get something into the curriculum. Now, listen, I, I worked really hard to get my BS in chemistry. I don't want to get it diluted, but I do think that it wouldn't be bad to have a seminar or one course that's taught, and I think in many cases by a scientist and somebody outside of science, maybe in communications, maybe in journalism, maybe in marketing, maybe in English. Somebody who, has a, who can balance, maybe in, journal, in political science, can balance things. And I think that wouldn't be a bad idea. I think it also has to be a curriculum into the graduate studies. Now, back in the day, how many, how many people, this is some scientists out here, had to learn a foreign language for their PhD? There's a few out here, right? That's gone. You don't have to know or be able to know German to translate. I think now we need a new curriculum. It's called the language of outside the ivory tower. And you have to master that before you get your PhD. Now, I'm not saying you're taking away all your study time, but you do have to be aware of current events. You do have to understand these things, because we are on a crash course of having to be more and more involved. I think that we should think about practicing. Think about it some days. If you read something in a newspaper and somebody asked you a question about that because it was so hot, you know, it's such a contentious issue, how would you respond to that? Play around once in a while. Be prepared if you think you're going to be interviewed. And then the last is if you think or you want to be involved or you want to write a letter to the editor or you want to write an opinion piece that shows some insight about something, there are people who can help you. You have a press officer at university. You have the English departments, communications department. You have the Harrington School now. Somebody's going to help you. Scientists come and get help. They want to help you, right, Winnie? Yes, right? But this is not easy. 
How do you take this leap? We lose the comforts, the nice, warm, fuzzy bed. Okay, how do we lead? You know, leadership and management are two different things. Management means you just tell everybody to go pick up something and do this. Leadership is willingness to take yourself out of your comfort zone so that you can move things forward. If you are going to engage and take yourself out of the lab, you have to be willing to do this. It takes courage. It is hard work. Okay? And you still got to be a good scientist. And that's, I, I, I believe that's the trick, and that's what makes it even harder. You still got to have chops. If you got good lab chops, you'll be okay by your peers if you end up being on the news or you're quoted a lot. If you do good science, you do good science. Okay. We don't have any metrics for success. If you try to get tenure at schools, everybody knows pretty quickly what you need. You gotta have so many papers, you gotta get so many grants, you gotta have so many graduate students, this, 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 and this, you gotta be on the library committee, yada yada yada. How do you define the success of good communication? I'm working on that. Could be a PhD for somebody. And we have to recognize the skill sets of each scientist. Okay, a lot of us shouldn't be on TV. A lot of us shouldn't be on the radio. A lot of us shouldn't be interviewed. A lot of us may have very powerful pens and could write a letter to the editor adding clarity to a report. I'm not talking about advocating. I'm talking about saying in this recent report by Sunshine, um, it was misinterpreted and such and add clarity. 70 words. You can do it. And that might be somebody's skill set. It demands courage. I was at the Unified Area Command, which is the oil spill headquarters, and I had an unbelievable time. And uh, people would come in for briefings, and I got to sit in all these briefings. Commandant Allen, who was in charge, undersecretaries for cabinet members. And one day, Food and Drug Administrator came in with some of her top scientists. And she, they gave this presentation about the efforts that they were taking to ensure food safety. And let me tell you, I am a science snob like you wouldn't believe. I am a skeptic like a champ. And I sat there and I was like, that's one of the best presentations I've ever seen in my whole life. I went back, I told people when I went back to work, I was like, FDA, man, they got their act together, right? So I had to go to Mobile, Alabama about a month later. I was waiting in the airport for my flight. I was this kind of diner. There was about seven seats. There was a guy holding court. Looked like he owned the place. And I was just sitting there, and I got myself a BLT. And somehow or another, they started. Now, this is November. Now, the oil was capped off on July 13th. By then, it's pretty hard to find much oil out there. And the guy says, I am never eating fish from the from the Gulf ever again. So I put my BLT down, ready to, to be courageous like I just talked in my last slide. And then he says, I will never eat seafood again because I don't want a side of cancer. And then all the other people at the table were like, yeah. <laughs> I ain't either. I kept eating my BLT. So I dropped the ball. I could have put myself into the game. I could have said, oh, no. I was at the Unified Area Command with the oil spill, and I'm a wonderful, smart scientist, and the Federal Food and Drug... No. I couldn't have done it. There was no way. And sometimes you have to walk away. I was a little disappointed with myself that I couldn't get into the game there and, and try to add some clarity there, but I just couldn't do it. Circumstances were wrong. It still aggravates me, and I didn't have the courage then. Or maybe I had good sense, but that's rare. I'm going to end on one last slide. Communicating science is risky, but not commuting is riskier. Science and journalism, science and journalism and the media have to find a way to work together. And if not, the science that we have is going to be misused, misunderstood, never used, or worse, science will just become a hobby. And the excellent results that we have will be just left on bookshelves and libraries.
Uh, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Chris. Oh, I don't have any. Hello? 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 Um, can you just remind people that we're asking for questions and there will be microphones on either side, but they're not going to be big ones. Uh, um, Sunshine says that we're asking for questions but not big rhetorical statements. And, uh, and there are questions. You have to use the mic. And I reserve the right to not answer. <laughs> I'm going to pull a BLT if I have to. <laughs> Hi, my name is Mark. I hey, Mark. did not go to high school in America, but as I understand it, in America they do teach science in high school. Yes. And they don't teach baseball. Why is it that people are so much better informed and in understanding of baseball, but not of science? Um, it's a lot more fun. It's uh, uh, you don't learn baseball by film strips, and you don't get to wear a nice uniform. I mean, science is just not a lot of fun in high school. When I remember it, I was lucky to have one a good one. A, I probably had two worthwhile science teachers. Now, I played a lot more baseball, and I could probably name 15 baseball coaches that I'm incredibly still fond of today. Yes. Absolutely. That's a little bit out of my comfort zone, but yes, I think you're absolutely right. I was, one, I was wondering if you could give us an example of a story that you thought was communicated well by the scientist and covered well by the journalist. I know it's more mechanical engineering than oceanography, but it seemed as if we had a better understanding of the Chilean miners a rescue than we did of anything that happened in the Gulf. But can you give us a, uh, an example? Um, <laughs> it's funny. Uh, if you were at dinner, and this is so completely off base. It's it's it's, and and, and I might be getting myself in trouble, but I'm going to go with it. Um, after the Congresswoman Gabby Giffords got shot, I thought that the doctors who were treating her were gave better reports on her status with clarity and often not such good news um, than most scientists could in that respect in terms of communicating. I thought that was good. I mean, they cut half her skull off. Nobody says, why did they cut half his skull off? I mean, I'm getting way out of my skill set right here, but I think one of the reasons why Medical doctors may be better at communicating medical issues than scientists are, is that they have to communicate to their patients, and we don't really have a patient. So uh, that's actually, the, I've, I've, I have followed the Gabby Giffords um, from a scientific and communication basis, and I, I think it's, a, it's been well covered. In part because I think, the science, I think the medical doctors have been very good at, at discussing uh, the science behind this woman's um, you know, fatal shooting. Not fatal shooting, but very dangerous shooting. I was wondering if you could speak to the issue of uh, speaking about complex issues in the age of sound bites and the yeah. question of oversimplification but delivery of a clear message when really all you have is the time of an elevator pitch to deliver a scientific thought. If you could speak to that, I would appreciate it. Yeah. Well, the first thing is, if somebody says, dumb it down, I'll strangle you, um, because it's not. In fact, if you can transform a complex issue into something relatively understandable, then you are outstanding. It is much, 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 much harder to take something complex and try to use with metaphors in any other capacity you have in your skill set to explain that. And it is much, much more challenging. And all I can say is if you think somebody's going to be asking you a question about that, practice. Practice all the time. There's nothing wrong with that. If, you, if, somebody's, if you're working on, if you're, you're a PhD student, or somebody's going to ask you what you're working on, and you know you're going to somebody's wedding, practice it. And you know what? It's a good brain teaser. It's much better than those other crossword, not crossword, the, my grad students with the numbers, and I don't understand it, Sudoku. 
don't do the Sudoku. Practice on how you're going to communicate your talk in a way. But you're right, sound bites are tough. Length of a sound bite is going from something like 17 seconds in the news down to three seconds or something like that. Like, you guys can correct me, but whatever the case may be, it's dropped down a lot. As a somewhat of a follow up to the last question, it seems that people often believe medical doctors, and I think it's more of an opinion question. Do you feel like there's different perceptions in the public about different types of science? So when a medical doctor speaks, the public just believes that person, whereas a professor or a doctor that speaks about the environment or some other aspect of science may or may not be able to. Yeah, I, 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 you know. And I know I shouldn't open stuff? my mouth up about Gabby Giffords, but I couldn't resist the urge. I, Oh, I, what I'm going to say is I think people can relate more when they can, when they can wrap their arms around it um, figuratively. And I think when we think about things like um, a medical problem, we can, conceptually we can wrap our arms around it. When you think about climate change, we can't put the earth in an MRI. And that is hard to otherwise convey. Yeah, uncertainty is so hard. We have to live with it. No, I, I know. I, I have thought about this at length, that an oncologist uh, can be off by a factor of, you know, can be twice as short or twice as long, and I don't think it has the same stigma uh, than in earth science. And I, I don't know that answer. But there are differences in, in, in the perceptions. I think that people understand medical doctors more because they interact with them more. Well, I do think that they practice more, and so they, you know, they, they have to communicate every day. Now, I, I, I want to be clear here. Scientists should be doing science. You know, I'm not saying, anything, but, but you, know, you, you should have in your back burner a little something in your back pocket you can pull out if you need it. And, uh, and, and maybe... Any way you can practice in any opportunity to try to do that, you should do it. Don't, if somebody asks you what you do, don't just blobber off about something. Say, I study how fish live at, deep, at the bottom of the ocean. Much better than you know, some long-winded discussion about something and the name of the species of the fish. Let them ask you what the species of the fish. Let them do that. You know? You know, just give them enough, and if somebody's interested, they'll keep asking, and you'll keep building the story, and that's the way you want to lead a story. So just ask, just lay, it, lay, lay one, what they call a coin. Lay, give them a golden coin, and if they want more, they'll pick up another one. If they want more, they'll pick up another one. Um, I was just wondering, how do you use terms like very little or a lot when you're talking about very specific numbers that... You can't really objectively attach to those words, but no. you can't use it. I, I think that's the problem with a lot of those quotes that I put out earlier, with the mays and the likelies and the, all that stuff. It's hard you know, to put those numbers on. Um, and because uh, some, what is some? Some of the oil is going to stick on the bottom. How do you put a number on that? I think it's very hard. I think what you would say is there is some oil that's been found at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico, and we are working right now to, to get a better number or estimate as to the extent of it. And that's all you can say in some cases. And that's, a no, that's something that I say a lot, actually. Um, you had a slide up about the difference between environmental scientists Yes. I call them environmental advocates. Yes. I learned very early on in my PhD training that there is a definite difference. Yes. Um, but I've also been in discussions lately about how uh, uh, climate scientists have failed in their message about climate change. And I've been hearing from members of the scientific community that maybe it's time to take more of an advocacy role hmm. and step out of their completely objective emotionalism. I think that's an absolutely horrible thing to do. And um, I am going to refer you to a New Yorker article by, that's about Jim Hansen, the, the NASA scientist who may be one of the most 
acclaimed uh, scientist for um, you know letting everybody know about climate change. And this New Yorker article came out a couple of years ago, right after Hansen had picketed at a coal-fired plant. So he clearly was taking on what you're saying. Let's bring in the big gun scientists. Let's make them more advocate, advocate-like. Okay. A major non-governmental office, I mean non-government organization that's very interested in climate change and is very influential and has a lot of money, was asked about Hansen's recent activities and his advocacy. Now these people probably have Hansen on their wall. And you know what the person said, the director of this, this non-governmental organization? Hansen should be back in the lab. Their hero. And we don't want him being an advocate. He's, we've got to get him back in the lab. That's where his value is. That's where his work is. You know, I don't know how we're going to get and how we're going to communicate climate change. But I would not take my horses out of the stable. I keep them right there working. And, and, and if you need Hansen to speak to Congress with clarity and, and passion, he can talk about it stuff. He can talk about a topic passionately. Um, that's okay. That's good. I want him in the front. But I, I agree with what this NGO said. No, he loses their value to the climate push by, um, by picking in coal places. Now, he has all the free rights to do anything he wants. So. As a follow-up to the advocacy question, did you find at any time in your work that... Um, factual relevance of scientific work uh, was not on equal standing with political sway? Could you, could you reframe that, ma'am? Yeah, please. Well, I wondered, um, I, I read chemical and engineering work quite frequently. Yes, and, uh, the People Magazine of Chemistry. The People Magazine of Chemistry, it's true, and they have a great section. It's great, I love uh, it. In there about government, uh, mm -hmm. And, and laws that are currently being passed. Mm -hmm. yep. Lots of political involvement in Congress. And so I wonder about um, the current climate in Washington, which is always changing, and, and how it views scientific fact uh, with respect to uh, political uh, sway, political belief of certain ideas. And I wondered if you had come across that uh, dynamic in your um, dealings uh, with, with Deepwater Horizon and, and what you. Um, no, I mean, I don't think I've ever seen the sway. I do think that, uh, and this is my personal opinion by sitting in, what, in Congress before I go up to bat or something, I do think that sometimes uh, the scientists were trying to be pleasers, and in part because it's the first time that they were up to plate. Um, and so I do think that's happened. And because, y you know, Testifying in Congress is an incredibly intimidating. They're all sitting up there. They're way too tall, you know. The, your microphone works at like a tenth the volume that they do, right? They make your chair wobbly. I mean, they can put you in the worst position, right? And you know, this this you know somebody is just boom 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 boom. And if you're not battle tested or ready for it, you can sw you can be swayed. And I've seen it happen. Um, it's hard to say no, and I've said no several times. Like, I disagree with you. And um, they don't like to be told no at all. But you, you have to stick to your guns. And if you do, you do. And that's it. I'm not sure if. Oh, wait one second. Uh, I forgot to say, I went to Chester W. Barrows High School on Beachmont Ave. I went to Parkview Boulevard on Parkview, Ave, Parkview Boulevard in Cranston. I went to Cranston High School East on Park Ave. I went to Rhode Island College on 600 Mount Pleasant Avenue. And I went to the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography. I am educated through and through Rhode Island public and very lucky to do so. Be so. <laughs>
thank you again, chris. and thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. before we adjourn, i just wanted to let you know that our next lecture will be march twenty ninth here. it will be skip oh, oh, i'm trying to get myself to the last slide that's going ah here we go whew it's going to be dr. robert ballard from the graduate school of oceanography, who will be talking about exploring the deep ocean, the last great frontier. and we hope that we'll see you here on march twenty ninth for that lecture. thank you again, dr. reddy.